Welcome to Beginning Ham Radio. We are sponsored by the Portland Amateur Radio Club. Tonight's topic is going to be ham radio equipment reviews. We're actually going to expand that just a little bit, uh, just finding out any information about equipment that you might want to know before you go out and purchase. So one of the things uh, about ham radio is that it can be somewhat technical. One of the more common questions uh, that the club gets and even people who have been in ham radio for a while is once you get your license, what do you, what do, you do? What do you buy? Um, that question comes up a lot and um, we won't necessarily be able to answer exactly what radio you should buy tonight. But what I wanna do is kind of take you to some different sites to show you things that you can look up, you can compare and contrast. Um, a lot of radios today, like the Baofeng radios, aren't very expensive. And so that's where a lot of times people start out with is buying that $25 or $35 radio off of Amazon, um, the Baofeng, the Oshan radios. Um, they have their place. Um, they're not necessarily a radio that you would want to use in an emergency situation because they're not necessarily all that reliable. Um, my own experience with the Baofeng radio is that uh, I, I have a few of them. And if you're a ham for more than a year, more than likely you'll have at least one Baofeng radio. I loaned mine to some people uh, recently and they came back dead within about a month to a month and a half. I don't know what these people were doing with it, but they just didn't seem to last very long. So one of the things to keep in mind is that before you buy a radio, try to go out, compare, uh, compare the technical specs with um, other radios that are kind of that look similar or have similar features, but also go out and ask people. And then even be, be above and beyond that, since we are in the age of the internet, there are a lot of sites that have reviews from people who have owned the equipment for anywhere from a day to five years or more, and they just want to give their honest opinion. Now, one thing to keep in mind is that just like any other online place, um, you need to take certain reviews, certain information with a grain of salt. So one of my favorite sites to go to when I'm first reading about a, um, a new piece of equipment or something that I'm considering buying is eham.net. This is uh, one of the independent amateur radio um, uh, sites that not only has um, information like news and you can look up call signs, um, they do have a swap meet on it. So if you're looking to buy used equipment, this is a good place to, to look. Um, but they also have under resources here, they have, uh, I'm sorry, not under resources, yep. Uh, under community, they have reviews. And so in reviews, they have um, categories. So if you're looking for a handheld transceiver, it is down here. Like let's say a, um, a handheld VHF or UHF transceiver. So you can uh, click on this category and then they're listed by um, manufacturer. So one of the more popular radios is Yesu. So they would be all the way down here at the bottom. Um, and the FT60 used to be kind of the um, gold standard when buying a first time quality handheld radio. Uh, but recently, well, not recently, maybe five years ago, they have the um, FT70. It's a dual band digital uh, handheld. It also does analog, so it's a digital and analog and it's the upgraded version of the FT60. And you can see that they have 61 reviews for this one. It got an overall rating of four stars versus the older one, the FT60, has a lot of reviews, 323 at 4.6 stars. Um, and you can just go in here and take a look and see how people, well, you know, what marks people are giving the radios. Um, again, keep in mind that some people, if they buy a lemon, which happens every once in a while, they may give it a one-star review. Whereas people who have had no problems, they might give it a five-star review. Um, not, I don't just look at the reviews on these. I also take a look at what problems have they had with the radio. 
And if there's not just like one or two people, but if there's like a ton of people that are saying, hey, the battery life on this thing is really bad. Like it just eats batteries. Well, if you're looking at a, a handheld, that's probably a, a pretty big Achilles heel. You don't want to be out in the field thinking you have, you know, five, six hours of battery life um, and have your battery run down in less than an hour. Um, or if you do decide that that's an okay thing just because of all the other features it has, you'll know, hey, maybe I should buy extra batteries or have some other way to power um, the HT. If it's, an, you know, maybe an external battery or you hook it up to your car or whatnot. So that's uh, one way to find out reviews from this site. I like this site because it does give a brief description. It'll tell you what, you know, MSRP is the uh, manufactured recommended price. Um, I can tell you this radio is not uh, $199 or it's not $200. You can get this from HRO for $175, I believe, $174.99. And then they'll also give you the um, the manufacturer. In this case, it's Yesu. So yesu.com will get you the manufacturer. And a lot of times they'll tell you if the product is in production or not. A lot of these reviews are for uh, equipment that is no longer being manufactured by the company. But if you're going to ham fests or if you're buying used equipment online, you still want to know, like, is it something good or is it something bad? What should I watch out for? The nice thing I like about this site is that they do keep up um, the reviews from things that are no longer manufactured. And they may not even be manufactured in the last, you know, two decades, five decades uh, or whatnot. I'll stop right here. Any questions you guys have or any comments? So if you if you think you know uh, a lot about ham radio and you'd like to, you know, put in your two cents, now's the, a good time. All right, you guys are quiet today. So. The other uh, website that I like going to to find out about reviews is QRZ. And let's see, I had them up. Yep, right here. So I'm going to just start from the home page. Uh, their reviews aren't necessarily easy to find. It's simple, QRZ.com. Um, this is very similar to eham.net in that it will give you a lot of um, the latest news about ham radio. They do have a swap meet if you're looking for either buying or selling uh, ham radio gear, um, but they also have forums. And in forums, they have a lot of different categories. So they have, you know, a news forum, or if you, um, this is kind of where they sell, they have the swap meet is the ham radio gear for sale, but they also have like general ham radio discussions, or they have a DX zone. DX meaning long distance. So if you're interested in contacting people from other countries, this would be definitely be the forum for you. If you are um, kind of the, the, the kind of ham radio operator that likes to operate low power, usually that's five to 10 watts or less, uh, that's considered QRP. And so they have a QRP corner. Um, if you are looking to um, get into Morse code, they have, uh, they not only have like a Morse code area, but they also even have a straight key, which is the old time, you know, uh, dit da using just um, forming the individual elements by hand. So they have, and usually I have to search for it, they have an amateur radio equipment reviews. This is a little bit less structured, meaning that it's a, this right here is your typical forum where people are allowed to post new topics. Other people can reply to those topics. So for example, um, somebody is talking about the uh, Yesu FT2000 or FTDX3000, probably wanting to know which one they should buy. So that's the topic title and that's the title of the, the person that posted it. And there's 12 replies and you can see you can also see just how many people have uh, looked at that particular post. So about 4,200 people. So again, not, not as structured as the other one, but they do have a search function. So if you wanted to search for comments, suggestions, or whatever on the FT70, usually you can type that in there and search for it. 
And it may not be something that uh, is directly related to the FC70. Maybe they just mentioned it in the post and the post is really about something else. But if you scroll through here, like here's a uh, one that's titled Yesu FT70 DR. Again, take everything with a grain of salt that you get online, but it's a good resource if you're looking uh, either for a review uh, or if you have some issue with your radio and you need to find out, you know, how do I do this? Um, this is a good place to post questions to. The site is free um, with advertising. Uh, they do have membership options, but really, um, unless you're contesting uh, or unless you really, really dislike advertisements, then um, I would just use the free account. And of course, what is everybody's favorite uh, place to get reviews from uh, Amazon. Don't necessarily discount um, Amazon as, a, as finding out reviews. The one thing I would caution you about Amazon is if you're interested in buying ham radio equipment, Amazon may not be the place that you want to buy it from. So FT, the FT70 handheld, they do have 238 reviews. And just like any other Amazon product, you can go um, take a look at what those reviews are. Uh, however, the prices usually are considerably higher than what you can get at even uh, new prices with free shipping from Ham Radio Outlet or other places. So it looks like uh, they do offer free shipping for this product. Um, $219.95. However, if you just go to Ham Radio Outlet, it's $175 with free shipping. So that's a, a third place that I would um, recommend going for reviews. Uh, I would also caution against um, uh, buying new equipment off of eBay for the same reason. Um, there are a lot of people that will just buy new equipment from Ham Radio Outlet or other places and just post them up on eBay for a lot more money. And it's really just like, you know, hey, if somebody's gonna buy it, then they're gonna buy it. Uh, maybe they just don't know about Ham Radio Outlet. And I'll stop here one more time, just find out if anybody has any questions or comments. Hey, Max. Yeah. You, uh, you, should, already, you should also point out that some of the manufacturers don't honor the warranty if you're not the first buyer. Like, yeah, that's like a very good Yesu, point. I think, has a, clause, has a clause in there that, so <laughs> if you were to buy this item, and since you didn't buy it from you or the dealer, you're kind of out of luck if something goes wrong. Yeah, and you know, things don't usually go wrong, but it happens. Every once in a while, you'll get a, a radio that just somehow passed uh, the QC at the, the manufacturer, but when it got to your house and you fired it up, um, maybe you can't hear anything. Maybe it doesn't put out its full watts that it's rated at. Um, Jared, you're right. Uh, so with all the Yesu products, you get a Yesu limited warranty card. Um, you can fill it out. It's a really good idea. Um, and this card may or may not be included in what you buy off of eBay or Amazon. Yeah, I mean, if it's a smoking deal, then, you know, that could factor yeah. into your calculations. But if you're paying new price, you should get the warranty. Yeah, that's absolutely true. So I, I mentioned that I was gonna talk a little bit more about just beyond reviews. Uh, one of the things when you're hunting for your first radio or your first mobile radio, um, there are a lot of different radios. And so how do you know which one is better or which one has more features? Um, in general, just like anything else, the more features it has, uh, the more expensive it's gonna be. Um, one example would be this Yesu 70 uh, is a good radio. It does not have GPS in it. Um, they're more expensive models and uh, they're started like between $400 and $600. They do have GPS in them. Uh, amateur radio people use GPS for a variety of reasons, but one of them is uh, APRS, Automatic Position Reporting System and that is used for uh, text messaging and just generally reporting your position. For example, if you're gonna go on a hike, 
in an area without cell service, it's a great way to report back exactly where you are uh, to your friends and family at home. Um, race officials use it a lot. So if you are a, with a club or a group that's supporting communications with your um, for a particular race, then they oftentimes will put APRS either handhelds or mobile units into vehicles or, or on runners. And instead of checking in with each vehicle or each runner to find out well, where are you, the race, uh, the person that's running the communications for the race can just look on a map and see exactly where they are. So it's, again, one of those things that you can't do that with this radio, but there are more expensive ones that you can do it with. So how do you find out what are the specs of each of these radios? Well, each radio will have um, uh, usually, I would say usually have like some type of brochure that goes with it. So if you go to the yesu.com website and I'm gonna just go to their products and then down to their handheld radios. And I'm, I'm using this FT71 over and over again, just because it's kind of the, the same uh, radio and you can kind of see what I'm doing. Um, but in this case, you would just go to the FT70 and the file section, and then they actually have a uh, brochure. Usually they do. Yep. So they, they call it a catalog. But let's open that up. And here is, it's and usually there are two to five pages of um, pretty pictures on the front, some advanced you know, features uh, on the middle pages. And then on the very last page, usually there are specifications. And then there's also accessories that you can buy. Um, so this isn't necessarily true for every radio out there that's built, but anyone that's built you know, by a major manufacturer in the last few years, it, it's pretty easy to find the specifications of this radio. So one of the questions that I would as a first time operator have is, well, how much transmit power does this radio have? And so in this brochure manual here, let's go to take a look at what the um, power output is. And there we go, RF power output. So it has three, it has high, middle and low, and it's specifying that at 7.4 volts there are some radios that you can put in AA batteries um, that may not supply 7.4 volts. And so it may be lower uh, if you're running it off of an alternate power source, but high is five watts, middle is two watts, and low is half a watt. So this, these are good things to know, especially when you're looking at mobile radios, because one of the issues with mobile radios um, that I find, there are some that only have two power settings. Uh, or they have three power settings, but the lowest power setting is like 25 watts. Um, so if you are, for example, using your mobile radio and you don't need more than five or 10 watts uh, on you know, 90% of what you're doing, um, a radio that has a low power of 25 watts may be overkill for you. So if it's something that's important for you, you may wanna take a look at the specs, um, especially if you're comparing two or three radios together. Um, this is Dave. Can I interrupt yeah. with a question? Yeah. So I understand the idea of high, medium, and low, and whether you've got two or three. What I'm curious about is this whole issue of if I'm not next to a repeater and I just have the antenna that's on the radio and, my, and I'm up, let's say, in the mountains or something like that, am I going to be able to get a hold of anybody or do I need to put up a dipole or something to give myself the range? Because wouldn't I need more like 25 watts to really, you know, have a conversation? That, I mean, that's a great question because there, uh, and I have, I guess, two or three answers for you. You're right. absolutely right that there are some areas, a uh, lot of areas, in fact, where five watts is just not going to cut it for you. So a handheld uh, by itself, even with a dipole, may not be enough to reach the nearest repeater. Um, I'm thinking like, you know, Eastern, Southern Oregon, or even Southern Oregon on the north side, um, depending on terrain, depending on how low in the valley you are, or high up on a mountain you are, um, five watts may not cut it for you. Um, so you may need higher power. 
And I'll give you an example. So I was helping out with a race last weekend, the Mountain uh, 100. And I was at an aid station and I brought my handheld just to, to, for fun to try it out. But even with a, um, a, an antenna 25 feet up in the air on a mast, I could not contact any of the other stations at five watts. So fortunately, I, I kind of knew this in advance. And so I brought my mobile radio with me, which outputs 50 watts of power. And so I could, with 50 watts, easily contact the other stations that I needed to. Um, the other thing that kind of the second answer is what you alluded to is that uh, your rubber duck antenna that's on a lot of these handheld radios isn't a great antenna. Um, it's short, it's helically wound to make it smaller so that it's not sticking up, you know, uh, 19 or, or more inches above your radio. Um, the other thing is that you, as a person holding onto the radio, are actually the other half of the antenna. You're the ground plane of a handheld radio. So it's not a, a great uh, antenna to begin with. If you are trying to get to a repeater where you only need a couple of watts, it's, it's a great radio. If you're talking simplex with people a few miles away and you can actually make, you know, great connections with them, it's, it's not a bad antenna. Um, but that is something to think about. Did that answer your question? Yeah, that, that was great. That was kind of what I was wondering. And a lot my, of other, my other question was, you know, this whole issue of digital versus analog, am I going to be worse off in that same kind of situation with a digital versus an analog? Because everybody's saying we're all going to digital. Yeah, and, I, and Fred may have some uh, um, comments here too. I would say in general, um, analog is and will be around for um, many years to come. Um, amateur radio is slowly adding digital as one of the modes. Uh, even this radio, the FT-70, is an analog slash digital radio. Um, however, there are still a lot more analog repeaters and analog radios in use now today than there are digital ones. And in fact, most, if, if there is a digital repeater or a digital radio, almost always it's a, a hybrid. So it's analog and digital. So you can say that ham radio as a community, we're just adding on digital, we're not replacing it. Um, if you're going out hiking and you want to try to stay in communication with other people through repeaters, analog is still your best bet unless you happen to know that there is a digital repeater out there. Um, Max, Good, I have uh, two comments about um, uh, those questions. So the first question is about, um, you know, uh, power versus antenna. I would always choose antenna over power because um, the thing is uh, you have a radio, you are in you know, in the bad position and you transmit with 200 watts of power, someone will hear you. But the problem is if you don't have the antenna that is, you know, good enough, you will not hear anything. So that's one of the, the things. So then five watts, um, don't forget one thing on VHF, UHF, line of sight is the king. Um, you, if you think about it, and I think they're gonna talk about that at the next uh, uh, meeting, is uh, you can contact a satellite that is at 400 miles away from you with a five watt radio. Uh, so having more power, not necessarily means you're gonna make more contacts or farther contact. What's gonna help you is, the, um, is a, you know, a better antenna and especially being higher. If you're with the, your you know, 100 watt radio in, um, in the canyon, you will not be able to make any contact. So that's the, you know, the most important thing on, on those things is, you know, line of sight. And for digital, um, yeah, AM, uh, not AM, FM is not going away or analog is not going away. But uh, if I had to buy a radio today, I would buy something that is capable of doing uh, analog and uh, digital because uh, uh, rep the, you know, the repair that are, um, there's more and more repair that are going digital. 
uh, there is more people that are moving into digital world. There is less and less activity on the on the repeaters, uh, local repeaters on 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 analog, and more and more activity on 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 digital. And if you buy a radio today as your first first radio, uh, a radio that is only analog, you're cutting yourself out of um, you know a lot of uh, uh, other arms. Uh, but if you're only interested by um, you know, emergency communication, uh, analog is your best bet today. Yeah, and one of the nice things about analog, I mean, sorry, not analog, uh, digital, is that one of the reasons that there are more people on digital uh, repeaters is because of the way that they're interconnected. So they're not necessarily just limited to, uh, you know, 150 foot circle uh, where they can broadcast. There are some networks, um, most of them are digital. In fact, the vast majority are digital, that uh, there are hundreds, if not thousands of repeaters all connected together. So you can, with your handheld, as long as you can talk into your local repeater, you can talk to people in China, Japan, uh, Korea, um, it, you know, all over the world um, easily from your handheld. Well, you, you don't need. You don't even need a, to have a repair. Just a hotspot. Yep. I will. Uh, so yeah, and Fred brought up the hotspot, and there are people that still like to use the radio uh, even with a hotspot. But that's why a lot of these newer handheld radios are coming with lower wattage. So in the past, you know, um, one or two watts kind of was the lowest that you could, uh, that a handheld radio could output, because I mean, like who, you know, who wants to use a quarter watt or an eighth of a watt? Well, now that you have hotspots, you know, a lot of people, they like to use it um, either while they're traveling or in their home, they can still use the radio, but the radio only needs to reach over into the other room or into the hotspot in the same room. And the less power you use, the longer your battery lasts. So it's, it's perfectly acceptable to use half a watt to talk to the hotspot in, in your room. The other great place, uh, great resource that I wanted to mention, um, not getting paid for this either, but they have a lot of great information is Ham Radio Outlet. Um, not only for just like getting the prices, um, but also just looking up the specs. Now there are individual web pages for each of the items, and I'm just clicking on a random handheld radio, won't necessarily give you all the specifications for the radio. They'll tell you a little bit about it, and they'll tell you like which ham radio outlets uh, is in stock versus which is out of stock. But I usually go to their catalog. Um, they do publish a catalog. I believe it's um, three to four times a year. Um, they usually mail it to my house in paper format. I don't really look at it because most of it's in black and white and the online catalog is in color, just a little bit nicer. And you can find it uh, just using their um, menu system up at the top. And you would go to um, more and then HRO catalog. And the okay. HRO catalog comes in a single view or a wide view. And you used to be able to download it. And I don't, I think you still can actually. So if I switch over to the single view catalog, it pulls up a PDF version in my browser. If you wanted to download it, you would just download it however your browser allows you to download it. But I think I think they started this year. The new catalog is uh, in color now. Yeah, it's well. Oh, oh, you mean the the mail catalog? Yeah, yeah, the one they send yeah. you by uh, the post. That's good. Yeah, because when I remember, you know, a couple of years ago, at least um, the front page or the front cover was in color, but everything else was in black and white. And so if you really wanted to take a look at what a radio looked like, I prefer to see it in color. So I would always go to the online version. And so the first few pages is really your the mobile uh, handheld and base stations. Um, they always start with a Linko. ICOM is next, then Kenwood, and finally Yesu. And this is a, a nice place to find information about the radio. Again, it doesn't give you all the specs, but if you really wanted to quickly see 
well, what does, you know, an FT991A, what are its specs compared to, I think the comparable one that ICOM makes is the 7300, if I remember that correctly. That may be one page back. So they, they have the 7100. Um, there are differences, and, and you can tell what differences there are just by um, taking a look at this catalog. It'll give you some specifications. For example, the 7100 is uh, D-Star capable, whereas the, uh, and that D-Star is the digital version flavor of uh, voice digital for ICOM, whereas the 991A, which is down here, comes with uh, System Fusion which is Yesu's version of digital voice. So it's a, it's a good place to take a look. Um, I don't know if they still do this. Uh, a lot of times when you look at the prices, like you'll see that they don't list prices in here and every single item that didn't list a price, it would always just say call. Like you would have to call ham radio outlet to find out what price it is. I see that they don't even bother to list that in here anymore, but not really a big deal. You don't have to call them anymore, which is nice. You would just go to the their website, type in whatever model you're looking for, FT70, and then the price is right there. So FT70 is uh, 174 after their discounts. So one one thing I like about uh, I'm radio out that is um, you see um, you know under the picture of the radio where you have those uh, you know Atlanta and I am uh, Portland Oregon and etc cetera, etc cetera. it so one of the cool thing when you order on uh, from I'm radio outlet is uh, they gonna send you if you order online they're gonna send you the radio from the store that is the closest to you. So that means uh, usually um, if I order something from I'm radio outlet I get the thing in two days without paying extra or anything because it comes from uh, um, from uh, Sacramento for me. So it's pretty quick. Yeah, so uh, Fred, um, I know uh, Fred's in the Bay Area. Uh, I lived down there for a number of years. Um, oh, you guys don't, so there was one in uh, Sunnyvale. Oh, it's closed and, a long time ago. Yeah, and then there was also one in Oakland. Yeah, they both they merge. The Oakland and Sunnyvale okay. they merge. They went to Oakland, and now um, Oakland they raised the price. Uh, you know the renting price for uh, buildings, and now they had to move to uh, Sacramento. Sacramento. Yeah, they do have a pretty good deal, and they they do have fast shipping. So again, uh, when you're looking at stuff, especially on Amazon, come here first. Make sure that you're not um, uh, that the prices aren't lower here on ham radio outlet they have free shipping for anything i think over 99 or 100 dollars. it's one of the two the the thing also is they hire a ham radio operator as um you know to work their warehouse or uh, their store and if you send an email saying okay i have that radio i have a prime i don't know how to do this or i cannot figure out that thing they reply pretty quickly to you, uh, you know, right away and they, uh, and, uh, and they give you an answer and uh, they're, you know, very uh, reactive if you have a question or if you have a prime. Uh, also, uh, they're, you know, kind of, uh, they, I mean, yeah, I like uh, uh, Amradio Outlet. They don't have everything, but, uh, but um, usually I try to buy from them. Yeah. The other really popular one, uh, because they've done a lot of marketing is DX Engineering. Um, they're newer, uh, but they are fairly large and they also send out print catalogs. Uh, I would definitely check the price against Ham Radio Outlet. Um, they do have free shipping over, I think it's 150 or 100, 150. Sometimes they do have deals. Um, you can sign up for their free catalog uh, and then you can also download it uh, or view it on the web. But they um, have similar search functionality. So if you wanted to look up uh, the Yesu FT70 here, um, it's, you can see it's, it's actually the same price as Ham Radio Outlet. Another site that I find a bit fascinating is um, Universal Radio. Universal Radio, they do sell uh, new equipment. Um, you can buy the uh, FT70 here, 
But the one of the things that I do like about them is that they all their old listings and Universal Radio has been around since a long time. I guess the top it says uh, since 1942. So a lot of their listings for radios that haven't been in production for 20, 30 or more years, uh, they still have the listing for and they still have the uh, accessories that came with it at the time uh, when it was being sold. So here is my first ham radio. I bought this in 91, uh, the, uh, the ICOM 2GAT. Um, didn't have as many features as a lot of radios today. Very, very tiny display on the top, but it was a pretty cool radio at the time. Um, so you can see the picture of it, uh, and you can also see all the excuse me, accessories that it came with. So if you are looking uh, at used equipment, say for example, at a, a ham fest or, or um, even online, uh, you can come here to kind of see some of the uh, features that it had. Cool. Any questions, comments? Yeah, this is Dave again. I got one. Yeah. Um, it seems to me that every other retail world area is, sector is consolidating. Why isn't there a global, you know, ham radio website that's dedicated to this? Um, you know, what about Europeans and people in the rest of the world? Do they come to our sites or where do they go? So uh, I, having not lived in a, a foreign country a long time and tried to buy ham radio equipment, um, I am pretty sure that uh, Japan uh, is uh, pretty easy to get ham radio equipment just because there are a ton of Japanese that are amateur radio um, uh, Operators, Aficionados. yes, Aficionados. exactly. So, in fact, enthusiasts. <laughs> What's that? Enthusiasts. Yes. So, Yesu uh, is actually a Japanese company, um, and they are one of the three major manufacturers of ham radio equipment. Um, so, it's fairly easy for them to buy. Um, there may be some other countries, uh, like the United Kingdom, that it is somewhat easy to buy. But from what I've read throughout the years, a lot of places do have trouble buying ham radio equipment. Um, and this goes into other things as well. Uh, in Canada, it's the availability is not as great as it is in the US. And in places like um, Australia, uh, I think the, uh, some of the Australians will try to buy it through uh, US channels because it's just so much more expensive in Australia. So it's in Europe, in Europe, they have their own, I mean, they have their, uh, uh, like a DX engineering, uh, there is a Germany uh, store called uh, Wemo, I think, W-E-M-O. Uh, they sell a lot. It's like, um, you know, DX engineering uh, for Europe. So there is a lot of uh, European, they're buying, um, you know, their radio from, from Germany. Uh, UK, they have a few sites also where uh, they are, uh, you know, uh, pretty well equipped. Uh, don't forget one thing is, uh, it's hard to buy uh, for Europeans. I mean, for someone that lives in a different uh, um, uh, region, it's hard to buy radio because the specificity for the frequencies and everything depend on the on the ITU region. And uh, you, uh, if you look at uh, Yezu, for example, you're going to see a, a, a radio for the US market and the same radio for the European market or the, the, the Asian market because the there is some specificity on the on the on the bands that, uh, for example, in UK they have the four meter four meter band that we don't have here. Uh, the two meter uh, band on in Europe is uh, narrower than what we have here in the US, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, uh, to they they have you know uh, it's not necessarily um, easier for them to buy in in the US. No, that's that is true. Yeah. So Europe they have different codes that they use for example, for bringing up repeaters. Um, in fact, uh, Yesu, they typically sell a North, uh, a North American version, and then they'll sell a European version. So when you're buying a radio, make sure that uh, it is North American, unless you specifically know it's going to work for your application. Um, it's not I only am... when you buy a radio, it's also when you upgrade the, the firmware. So mm -hmm. I have a friend who, uh, who did an upgrade of the firmware for uh, his uh, 991. And uh, he mistakenly uh, took the firmware from Europe 
and it ended up he couldn't work some of the frequency because uh, because they are not the same. That's yeah, that's a great point. Different firmware. So um, the last thing I wanted to mention is um, when you buy uh, equipment, not from ham radio outlet or anything like that, but if you're buying from an individual, um, you want to use just common sense like you would buy things off of Craigslist or eBay. Oh, eBay is, uh, well, I guess, yeah, you could use eBay. Um, sometimes, you know, unscrupulous people will sell you equipment that doesn't work, but is supposed mm -hmm. to work. Um, and this may be even more true with uh, websites that don't have like the Amazon guarantee or the eBay, you know, guarantee. So if you're going to buy equipment off of, for example, uh, Eham, and let me just pull up Eham as an example, go to um, community, I'm sorry, resources, classifieds, and let's take a look. Okay, so here's for sale an ICOM 706 MK. Uh, great radio, they don't make it anymore. Um, sad when they, they, uh, they discontinued it. So he's asking uh, 575 plus shipping. The one nice thing about um, ham radio is that in most of the time when one ham is selling to another ham, we have call signs that you can easily look up and find out their first and last name and their at least their mailing address. Um, so it is sometimes a little bit more safe to do that. But even ham radio people, you know, not everybody is fair. Um, and sometimes even in the classified section of eham, you'll see warnings about don't buy from this particular person. Um, they used to now they have changed it a little bit, but they used to have the call sign of the person. Maybe it's because I'm not logged in. But they used to have the call sign of the person that's actually listing the item for sale on eham and, and QRZ. Um, so that's just one thing to be concerned about. So don't, don't send somebody a, um, a cashier's check for a radio that you're purchasing and they're going to ship it to you. So either meet them in person or use some other type of, uh, um, method of payment such as PayPal. But when you use PayPal, you may consider not using the friends and family. There's no protection for friends and family. So if I'm going to buy a radio that Fred's selling and I send him $300 using PayPal friends and family, uh, and Fred sends me a box with a brick in it, um, there's really no recourse mm -hmm. except for outside of PayPal. I wouldn't like do they, that. What's that? I wouldn't do that. Of course not. No. <laughs> <laughs> so that's why sometimes, you know, ham, uh, ham fests are a really good place to pick up used equipment, not only because is it priced lower, um, because a lot of times when people post classified ads on eham, they're willing to wait three, four or five months. And if nobody buys it, that's fine. So the price might be a lot higher. Whereas if you go to a ham fest, um, sometimes the the people that are selling and the, the used equipment or the swap meet, they don't want to carry it home. So if it's still there uh, after a few hours or after the second day and it's 70 bucks, sometimes I, off, I tell them I'll pay 40 bucks for it. And sometimes they say no, and sometimes they say deal. So just something to keep in mind. The issue is because their wife told them to get rid of that thing and uh, they don't want to go back home with that. Uh... Yeah. So uh, speaking of Hamfest, um, Rick Rial is uh, a twice a year Hamfest, uh, ham fair that is in uh, just west of Salem, Oregon. That's Rick Rial, Oregon. And they are having their first in-person ham fest October 16th. And I'll pull up the, uh, the website for that. If anybody's interested in going to uh, something like that, you can either buy it ticks in advance or you can buy them at the door. I think in advance it's like um, $10 at the door, it's $12. 
I'll share my screen. So all I did was Google uh, Rick Riala Ham Fest. And there it is right there. It's uh, October 16th. It's called Swaptoberfest. Um, they have it in October and February. And if you just click on the flyer, um, it'll tell you if you want to uh, just go um, to buy tickets, you can do it through the mail um, or you can do it at the door. Um, let's see, we're at, uh, $10 at the door. Uh, looks like actually they're not doing any mail in this time. Mm -hmm. So it's just simply $10 at the door. Uh, if you're looking for good stuff at this particular ham fest or any ham fest, the best time to go is early, like right when they open. Um, however, there's a lot of crowds, um, but they have a lot of good stuff that, um, you know, might be priced right. Uh, they probably have a lot of good stuff that's uh, too high and you might want to pass it by a few times. Um, after the crowds start dying down three to four hours later, that's when you can get the deals. This particular one is a one day only. Um, so it's 9 a.m. to 3 p.m. So the best time to, to get deals is about two o'clock um, when people start packing up. They do um, also allow people just like you and me to have vendor tables. And this is not particular to this particular ham fest. There's a lot of ham fests that have um, what they call swap meets um, or vendor tables where for $10 or, or about that, you can buy a, um, it was about a three foot by eight foot table. A uh, folding table that you can bring all your stuff. You can put stuff under the table for sale. Um, just put little price tags on it and wait for people to come, you know, pay you cash or make you offers. Uh, some people will do trades and things like that. So it's a lot of fun. I've done both uh, help, helping people sell some of their stuff. Um, you do have to get there early if you're going to uh, set up a vendor table um, just so you can get in before they let everybody else in. Um, the interesting thing about this particular one, and I'm sure this happens most um, ham fest, is that if you want the uh, if you want to be the first person to see all the stuff that people have for sale, if you have a vendor table, after you're done setting up, you just go walk around all the other tables and you can buy stuff before even the first person waiting at the door can get in. The other ham fest that's uh, very um, popular here is uh, CPAC. And this is a once a year um, out in Seaside, Oregon. And so they had uh, they canceled the one uh, this year because of COVID, but I think they're they're planning on having it next year, June 3rd through 5th. So this is a multi-day. Uh, they also have uh, new vendors. Um, they have a vendors hall where you'll see the major companies like ICOM, uh, Kenwood, Yesu, um, but then they also have a uh, swap meet, I think is what they call it. Um, you can also get tables there or you can just go browse the swap meet tables. Um, being a larger event than Rick Real, they're going to have uh, speakers. They usually have testing. So if you want to go there and get your cam radio license and you feel you can pass the test, um, you can take your test in person there. Uh, it's a lot of fun. Um, a lot of people, because it's a multi-day event, will get a hotel room somewhere along the coast there uh, and, and go to, to both days. So you, not, you won't necessarily find your first radio if you're looking for like a new, uh, new radio. Um, but if you uh, want spare parts or if you want... Uh, you know, old tuners or old radios, um, or even some slightly used newer radios, a great place to, to buy, to go visit. Cool, I think that's gonna be the end of my uh, presentation. So if anybody has any comments or questions about new hey, used equipment. Yep. Um, Hi, Stevie. For, oh, hey. Um, for anyone that um, is missing CPAC and really just has to get a, a conference in, um, Pacificon is the 15th of, through the 17th of October. Um, I'm definitely looking forward to that. I can't wait. So I'm going to drive all the way down there. It's by uh, San Francisco area. Yeah, you're driving down there. You, you bet I am. More, <laughs> can you tell us more about it? Oh, what yeah. It? Um, it's Pacificon. It's in San Ramon. Uh, California, which is 
kind of by San Francisco, October 15th through the 17th. And I believe Gordon West and uh, Jim, Kit Building Jim is going to be there, a couple other guys and gals. So I'm looking forward to that. Yeah, I went to this a couple of years ago. Um, oh, and when I was down in the Bay Area, I actually was able to go more often. Um, it is East Bay, so it's San Ramon, uh, California. Uh, it's bigger than Pacificon. It is a lot of fun. Uh, you get to see a lot of people. Um, they do have a very large um, new and used uh, ham expo. And they also have a lot of um, talks and presentations. And you have a parachute mobile. Yes. And these are guys that uh, jump out of airplanes uh, with parachutes, obviously. And they make a lot of contacts as they're coming down to Earth. <laughs> My buddy Carlos does that. <laughs> yeah. And How I, much I, is I don't, it's not very much. It's probably $25, what I'm guessing. Let's see. Registration. And this is another one because it's a multi day event. Uh, a lot of people will just get a hotel. Now, there's a lot more people that go here, and the Bay Area is just going to be more expensive for hotels. Um, you're looking at, like, you know, at least $200 a night, if not more. Um, but there are a lot of hotels and a lot of cities around there. So even if you're looking for something now, um, it's, you know, you'll, you'll find something. Um, you can take BART. Yeah. $25 until October 3rd uh, or $30 at the door. Oh, okay. Or if you're a college student uh, and lower than 25, then it's $5. Awesome. They have a lot of uh, really fun, events here they um probably also have some type of a build yeah kit building um, so when i went it was a um antenna uh an hf antenna that was really fun it took a couple hours um but you know you got to meet and talk with all the other people and build something so it looks like this year it's going to be a code oscillator or an led blinky light They also have, um, I'm pretty sure it's every year, the ARRL will set up their um, operating stations, I guess. And usually they have like five or six stations and they welcome hams who have their license to come operate at the, it's para. the station. Yeah, it's not there. the ARRL, it's PARA who's doing that. It's one of the clubs here. Time. Yeah. And uh, you don't need a license if you want to operate because it's like a field day. Uh, you are under the super supervision of a, a license operator, so you can even try a radio if you're not. If you're tech, for example, and you want to try a, a HF, that's a good way to, uh, to, to do it. Nice. Yeah, I don't see... Uh... Oh, special event station is probably what it is. Yeah, yep. that's part. Yeah. Yeah, so that it, that's a lot of fun. If you, they also have um, a lot of uh, um, Boy Scouts that will go there and operate. And the cool thing is, you can actually uh, take, you know, you can see a lot of uh, really cool radios because their setups are uh, are pretty nice. And you can even see how they set up. Um, so these right here are um, bandpass filters. So if you have a lot of radios that are operating in a very small area, sometimes on the same antenna. You need a way to kind of separate out the signals. Um, so it's, if, if you get a chance to go to something like this, take a look at how they have their radio set up. And of course, the you know we can't if we're going to talk about Hamfest, we can't miss talking about Hamvention. So Hamvention is uh, the largest, as far as I know, uh, ham fest in the US. Uh, they did cancel the last two, uh, 2019 and 2020. Um, however, it looks like they're having it in, uh, I'm sorry, 2020 and 2021. They are having it in 2022. Um, so hopefully that'll still um, be going on uh, next year. It's May uh, 20th through the 22nd. And there are actually other organizations like uh, five, uh, Four Days in May, um, which is a QRP enthusiast group. They'll have other events that are going on uh, near 
and Benjamin at the same time. So it is a long way to travel um, to from you know here or even California, but it is definitely the largest um, and probably the you know most interesting. So take a look at hamvention.org if uh, if you want to take a look at what attending that would be like. Cool. Any other questions, comments? Um, yeah, I've got one. Um, you were talking about uh, uh, the digital and the and the analog, and uh, you were talking about hooking up to repeaters and they would be digital. And what I'm wondering is why don't most repeaters just add digital to them, or is that what they're doing, or is is a digital uh, 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 what do you call it uh, a, a digital repeater like easier to to do you don't have to put it on a mountaintop so um no uh repeaters at least the ones that you can connect with through radio um, are still going to be on top of a mountain or on top of a like some t high location just so that the it's easier for whatever radio whether it's a handheld or mobile can get to it Right. Um, analog uh, repeaters, t um, I would say a lot of them are not connected to anything else. So it's really just whatever, you know, RF area that the, the repeater transmitter can cover. However, with the advent of uh, digital, um, a lot of it goes through the internet. So, and that's um, how a lot of these digital repeaters are hooked up together. They have been doing that for a long time, even when I first got my license, um, you know, even before Internet was available in my area. Um, repeaters could be hooked up together just to make a wider coverage area. But typically that was by using either microwave or some other like uh, 70 centimeter um, radio back channel that was connected to repeaters. Um, it is definitely easier to connect repeaters up today. You don't have to do that because of the internet. Um, to answer your first question about whether repeaters are just analog and why don't they just add digital, that's what's happening a lot of places. So our club, the Portland Amateur Radio Club, used to have an analog only repeater. However, um, we have since upgraded that to a Yesu repeater, which does both analog and digital. And the way that Yesu Fusion works is that it can be hybrid in the sense that if the repeater receives an analog signal, then it will repeat that signal through analog. But if it receives a digital signal on the same frequency at a different time, of course, then it will repeat it as a digital uh, signal. So it can be used by both analog and digital. However, one of the more popular digital uh, radios is called digital mobile radio or DMR and typically I don't Fred correct me if I'm wrong but all of those are strictly digital so in order to talk on those repeaters you would need uh, digital radio so uh, there's several aspects on the on that question so first of all um, people have been connecting repair even analog repair for a long time and they're still doing that uh, you have a lot of people, they're uh, changing the controller on their repeater to put a controller that is capable of doing all-star uh, or even echo link. And, and that's a way to connect analog repair through the internet to extend the, the, the life or extend the, the coverage of, 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 of a repeater and, uh, and, and, and basically to kind of give a second life to a, a repeater. But it's easier with the digital mode, and uh, you know, having a repeater that is not connected anywhere and being digital versus analog doesn't bring anything new. The, you know, the only thing interesting, in, in I mean, the, the main thing that is interesting in uh, in, uh, in digital is the fact that you can send more than voice, like uh, you can send data, like GPS information, or or text, or things like that, or pictures. And you can also interconnect those uh, to uh, chat rooms. And that's you know, why the people are moving to digital right now. Uh, if you have just a, have a digital radio and you want to do a simplex, 
I mean, you can do that in, uh, in FM. You don't need a, a digital for that. It doesn't bring anything new. The, the digital, the, int the interesting thing in digital is the interconnection of all those things together. So, so this raises a question. You mentioned uh, connecting to a hotspot. So if, I'm, if I have internet in my house and I can, how do I connect to that hotspot? So with my radio, uh, so that I can, you know, work work a, a communication. Okay, so um, so one of the thing I wanted to say also is um, uh, there is a lot of repair that are on top of a mountain, and they it's hard to interconnect them because they don't have uh, internet access on that mountain top because it's you know remote place or right. you know something like that. So that's right. some of the repair that are not connected for that reason. Then for the, the question on the hotspot is a hotspot is nothing more than a tiny, than a tiny uh, 100 milliwatt uh, repair that you have sitting on your desk. It's a you know, two inch by one inch uh, box uh, that is sitting on your desk. And that's, uh, that's basically a repair. It's nothing else than a repair. And uh, if you have a digital radio, so you set up that thing, you set up a frequency, you connect that thing on the internet, uh, you configure uh, that uh, tiny repair, and then uh, if you have a digital radio, you can talk to the world with that thing, like you would do with a big, huge repair on top of a mountain. Right. So when you use the term hotspot, it's not like the hotspot that I buy from Verizon and pay forty bucks a month, no. and it gives me internet in my house. Essentially. No, but it's, That's it's a, similar a, in its function. Yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a you know specific hotspot for a ham radio. Got it. So, um, Dave, it sounds like you are interested in digital radio. And if you want to find out more, which is great, um, Fred is actually going to be our speaker on the Thursday night, uh, October 7th. And so he's going to go through a lot of um, what the questions you may have for hotspots, digital radios, the different kinds of um, digital modes, because unfortunately, great. Um, we have at least five very popular flavors of digital radio for ham radio, and they don't necessarily all work together, unfortunately. Well, we've scratched the surface. Thank you. Yep. And great questions. Thank you very much, Dave. Thank you. Yeah, that's going to be a long talk on, on October. There's a lot of things to say. <laughs> Yeah, in fact, um, uh, Fred is going to be our speaker for the November monthly meeting. So the things that he doesn't cover on um, Thursday on October 10th, he's going to talk uh, about digital radio again on November 8th. And that's so November 8th. On November 8th, that's going to be the same presentation, but I'm going to go a little bit deeper on DMR because DMR is very popular right now. And that's the most complex mode. And that's the thing that people have a really hard time to understand. And, uh, and, 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 and yeah, it's, it's, uh, it, in terms of, in term of um, difficulties, uh, it's one of the most difficult thing you're gonna have to do in ham radio is DMR right now. Yes, it's, it's a lot of fun. I would just say it, it's definitely a lot of work to just sit down and really understand it and then try to figure out how to program your radio. Yeah, but if you have a, if you have a FT70, that's really easy. That's the easiest radio you can find. You have an FT70 with a hotspot and you can talk to the world. And I think it's a digital mode is very interesting for that reason for a technician, because right now, the only way a technician can talk to someone in UK is uh, using HF. Uh, if you, um, if you, uh, uh, and so money, basically you cannot, you cannot talk to someone in UK using a, a, a radio. You need to go digital to be able to do that. It's going to be either a, a all-star or it's, you're going to have to go full digital with DMR, uh, C4FM or a mod like that. Yeah, it, it can be a lot of fun just because there are certain channels or certain talk groups that have specific um, either geographic areas uh, or specific topics that they, you know, people talk about. Um, so to be able to 
sit in your living room or even in your car, uh, if you have access to a digital repeater somewhere, whether it's through hotspot or a repeater on the top of a building or a mountain, you can hear people in Australia or in South America. Uh, it's, it's really fun.